Okay, welcome to Chapter 2, Atoms. Uh, obviously, we'll be talking more about atoms and building on concepts that we uh, first encountered back in Chapter 1. Our learning objectives for this chapter will explain the ancient Greeks' ideas about the characteristics of matter. I uh, will also describe the significance of the laws of conservation of mass and definite proportions. Uh, we'll be able to calculate the amounts of elements from the composition of a compound. Uh, and uh, explain why the idea that matter is made up of atoms is a theory. Uh, and we talked a little about theories and laws back in chapter one, so hopefully that's not going to be too difficult. Once we understand uh, the idea of atoms as a theory, we'll uh, hopefully be able to know how atomic theory explains the laws of multiple proportions and conservation of mass. We'll describe what a mole is and how it is used. This is the chemist mole, not the uh, small animal that uh, you may be used to from biology, but rather an amount and something very uh, special to chemistry. We'll be able to convert between the masses and the moles of a substance, uh, and we'll be able to describe how the elements are arranged in the periodic table and why that arrangement is important. Finally, we'll be able to distinguish between atoms and molecules. Uh, we'll identify elements that could be classified as hazardous or rare, uh, and we'll explain how green chemistry can change technologies that rely on hazardous or rare elements. Uh, we talked a little bit about green chemistry back in Chapter 1, and it's certainly a direction we're going to uh, want to continue to move here as we talk about atoms in Chapter 2. So if we go back to ancient Greece, uh, we have around 384 BCE, before the Common Era, uh, Aristotle, a very famous philosopher, um, uh, attributed with a lot of uh, important ideas, uh, especially uh, concerning the natural sciences, as physics goes mainly. Uh, but uh, he did uh, have some ideas that influenced chemistry, uh, and unfortunately not for the better. Uh, his belief was that all matter is composed of four elements, and all matter is continuous, not atomistic. So that means you could just continuously divide matter and get smaller and smaller pieces of that matter, uh, and there was no level that that would uh, cease to be true. Uh, obviously, nowadays we understand that the uh, atom is the fundamental unit, and if you were to divide the atom, you can get subatomic particles, but they no longer have that characteristic uh, behavior for that particular matter uh, once you get below the atom level. Uh, now, even earlier, back in about 450 uh, years before the Common Era, we have Leucippus and Democritus. Uh, Leucippus, the teacher, Democritus, the student, and actually uh, the student became more famous for this theory than the teacher, uh, was that of atomos, uh, the point at which matter can no longer be subdivided. Uh, so this was uh, an earlier idea, uh, and uh, unfortunately, Aristotle, being the giant in philosophy that he was, uh, he uh, changed everyone's mind on all this. People just went the Aristotelian route, which was wrong, uh, instead of going the uh, way of Leucippus and Democritus uh, and having an atomistic view. Um, the problem here, and the reason why people were swayed toward Aristotle, is uh, there was no real way to test it back uh, 400 or so years uh, before the Common Era, some uh, roughly 2,500 years uh, before today. So um, it was just mainly based on your ability to construct an argument and to be compelling. And uh, when you're uh, a brilliant individual like Aristotle, you can do that even uh, when you happen to be wrong. Let's fast forward about 20, uh, 150 years or so to uh, Antoine Lavoisier uh, and his idea of the law of conservation of mass. Uh, Lavoisier is credited as being the father of modern chemistry uh, and uh, his insistence on careful measurement uh, was uh, really the, his reason for being able to be so successful. So uh, he measured everything before a chemical reaction and measured everything after a chemical reaction uh, and he was able to find uh, that indeed the amount of uh, mass of matter before the reaction and after the reaction was identical. So nothing's created, nothing's destroyed during the course of a chemical change. Uh, this was in direct uh, opposition to uh, a theory that had uh, arisen at that time. It was the, the theory of phlogiston, uh, that there was some stuff. Uh, as things like wood had lots of phlogiston in them, and when you burn them, the phlogiston got out, and that's why you were left with the ash. 
Uh, so um, Lavoisier came up with the much more uh, scientific approach uh, and uh, gist in theory uh, was uh, pretty well dead uh, after Lavoisier, or uh, at least it was damaged. There were a few, uh, like Priestley even, the discoverer, the one man credited with discovering oxygen, uh, Joseph Priestley, uh, who still clung to those phlogiston theories, uh, but uh, it, it, its days were numbered after Lavoisier. And so the reason that Lavoisier uh, was able to disprove phlogiston is people were mainly concerned with the, the mass of uh, the tangible stuff. Uh, so uh, they were looking at things like in this uh, graphic, the mercuric oxide, a red oxide, uh, and then mercury metal that resulted from the heating, uh, and they were ignoring the gas. Uh, and so Lavoisier was capturing even the gas, the oxygen gas in this case, that gets released on the decomposition of mercuric oxide. Uh, most people thought that was uh, the phlogiston escaping, but when Lavoisier was able to show that he can capture everything, uh, it really uh, put the death knell in phlogiston theory and brought us toward atomic theory and a better understanding of uh, how the world works according to the law of conservation of mass. All right, so let's fast forward to the end of the 1700s. Uh, and by now, unfortunately, Lavoisier uh, was dead. He had lost his head, uh, as many wealthy aristocrats did during the uh, reign of terror there at the French Revolution. Um, he was a tax collector, uh, although he was a very progressive individual, as scientists usually are. Um, it wasn't enough to save him, and he was beheaded in 1794. So uh, we no longer have Lavoisier to lead the charge, but we do have uh, Joseph Louis Proust, another French chemist, uh, who gave us the law of definite proportions. And so according to this law of definite proportions, a compound always contains the same elements in certain definite proportions. So, uh, for instance, water, uh, H2O, uh, always has uh, two hydrogen atoms and the one oxygen atom. So it would always have, uh, because of the masses of those being different, it would always have uh, the majority of its mass uh, due to the oxygen uh, and a small amount of mass due to the hydrogen, but always in those amounts. So looking at another example, uh, Proust's law of definite uh, proportions shows that regardless of the source, copper carbonate always has the same composition. So uh, whether it, it occurs in a particular phase, uh, here we see the, a nice uh, mineral phase of it in A, uh, we see that copper uh, carbonate forming on uh, a copper roof in, in the, the uh, image B, and then finally is a fine powder in C. Um, and these could have come from uh, any number of uh, mineral mines in the world, uh, they would always have that same uh, ratio, the definite proportion of copper to carbon to oxygen. Uh, building on Proust, we have uh, Jacob Berzelius, a Swedish chemist, uh, now having a famous experiment that illustrates the law of definite proportions very nicely. So uh, Berzelius was able to take a fixed amount of lead and sulfur uh, and make lead sulfide. Uh, and if he did it exactly the right ratio, as we see in the first example, 10 grams of lead to 1.55 grams of sulfur, he ended up with 11.55 grams of lead sulfide. So the overall mass stays the same. That's the law of uh, conservation of mass, uh, but also the proportion stays the same. So that's the mass ratio of lead to sulfur that gives uh, exactly a complete reaction and only the lead sulfide product in this case. Uh, if Berzelius uh, was able to uh, manipulate one or the other, in the second instance, he has still the 10 grams of lead, but he's almost doubled the amount of sulfur, uh, it shows that you still get that same mass of lead sulfide, uh, and you have uh, 1.45 grams, the excess of sulfur, uh, left over at the end. Uh, if, on the other hand, Berzelius uh, increased the amount of lead uh, to the original amount of sulfur, so now 18 grams instead of 10 grams of lead to start, uh, to that same 1.55 grams of sulfur from the first experiment, uh, you end up with that 11.55 grams of lead sulfide, as we have in every case, uh, but now you would have 8 grams of lead left over, because you had an extra 8 grams to start compared with that first uh, set of uh, reagent amounts that gave exactly the right ratio to get only lead sulfide product. 
So we have a couple important laws now, the law of conservation of mass and the law of definite of multiple proportions or definite proportions up until now. Now uh, with Dalton, uh, we're going to start to put these laws together into a meaningful way that uh, is the first um, scientific attempt at atomic theory. Again, we had atomic theory back with uh, Democritus and Lysippus, uh, but it wasn't uh, a scientific theory because it wasn't based on experiment. Here, the atomic theory of Dalton is based on experimental evidence. And so Dalton, uh, 1803, gives us the law of multiple proportions. Elements may combine in more than one set of proportions with each set corresponding to a different compound. So if we look uh, down in table 2.1, uh, we see that there are multiple ways to combine nitrogen and oxygen. Again, uh, previously with things like lead sulfide, we talked about the idea of them always coming together in a certain definite proportion. Now we're looking at the idea that uh, for at least nitrogen oxides, we can put them together in multiple ways. We can have compound number one, nitrous oxide, uh, which uh, has a, a mass of nitrogen per one gram of oxygen of 1.750. So that's one proportion. 1.750 grams of nitrogen to one gram of oxygen gives nitrous oxide. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, you have uh, just a nitric oxide a compound where you have uh, less uh, nitrogen, uh, we have now, for every one gram of oxygen, just 0.8750 grams of nitrogen. So uh, we have a smaller ratio uh, of the mass of nitrogen uh, compared with the mass of oxygen. Uh, finally, nitrogen dioxide, uh, we have uh, for one gram of oxygen, we have even less uh, nitrogen, 0 0.4375 grams, uh, or a one-to-one -one ratio of masses of nitrogen, uh, again, uh, based on uh, Dalton's early work. So there were more than one type of nitrogen oxide possible based on the uh, mass ratio, and you got very different behavior from uh, these three, in this case with the nitrogen, these three gas phase uh, products. And here we see a nice uh, pensive John Dalton uh, pick, uh, drawing, uh, the artwork showing the master uh, at work trying to come up with a, a theory, an overarching uh, set of ideas that would explain all of these uh, laws, the law of definite proportions, the law of multiple proportions, and the law of conservation of mass. So what uh, Dalton was able to uh, propose is uh, in his original atomic theory of matter, he proposed that all matter is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. So these particles are atomistic, not continuous like Aristotle's ideas of matter, but uh, discrete like the ideas of Lucippus and Democritus. Uh, he also postulated that all atoms of a given element are alike and differ from the atoms of any other element. So uh, atoms of lead were identical to all other lead atoms and different from atoms of uh, another substance like uh, gold. Uh, he also postulated that compounds are formed when atoms of different elements combine in fixed proportions. And we saw previously those three different nitrogen oxides uh, that were possible uh, with different nitrogen to oxygen proportions, uh, very different behaviors indicating very different substances. And then finally, uh, Dalton postulated that a chemical reaction simply involves the rearrangement of atoms. That's why the mass doesn't change, because you haven't changed the atoms involved. You've just changed their arrangement, uh, how they're connected to one another in three-dimensional space. Uh, so very good, very uh, important first step. Uh, unfortunately, he was wrong on some of these, and we'll talk about that later. But it was a very critical uh, initial understanding of atoms uh, that Dalton contributed in order to allow us to have the uh, more refined atomic theory we do today. One of the major flaws with uh, Dalton's initial atomic theory is that he neglected to recognize isotopes. So um, Dalton assumed that all atoms of an element are alike. Uh, every single lead atom uh, is the same if it's a lead atom. Uh, what he didn't understand, what he didn't have the uh, capability of testing at his time, uh, is the idea of isotopes, which are atoms of the same element with different relative masses. 
Uh, so, for instance, uh, with chlorine, uh, you have uh, atoms of chlorine that uh, have uh, overall masses of roughly 35 atomic mass units uh, and also uh, 37 atomic mass units. So there's those two different isotopes. They're the same chemically. They behave the same chemically because they're the same atom uh, type, but uh, they are different in terms of masses. You may have heard of heavy water, uh, which is uh, water, and it behaves like water. Uh, but it's made from the deuterium isotope of hydrogen instead of the more common protium. So it's a, a more massive uh, substance and it has different physical properties as a result, uh, greater density and things like that, uh, but chemically they're the same. So Dalton was right about the chemistry of elements being unique to the element, but he was wrong about every atom of an element being the same uh, for elements that have multiple stable isotopes. All right, moving along to the mole concept, uh, one of the, the key organizing themes uh, for our whole course is the idea of the mole and Avogadro's number. Uh, so a mole is the number of atoms in 12.011 grams of carbon-12. That's a very strict definition of the mole, um, but uh, based on uh, work started by Amadeo Avogadro, uh, he didn't live to see his number uh, discovered, but he laid the groundworks for us. Uh, that number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Uh, and because of Avag Amadeo Avogadro's work, it's often referred to as Avogadro's number. So uh, any substance that you have one mole of, you have that many atoms, and you'll have that characteristic value uh, for an element. You'll have the value from the periodic table. Uh, that's the mass number, uh, the average atomic weight of all uh, stable isotopes. For compounds, we'll see that we have to manipulate the elements involved and uh, get an overall mass number from the uh, constituent elements. But the mole is a critical concept in chemistry. Uh, so if, if you're having trouble with the mole concept, uh, if you're, you're not uh, able to uh, correctly answer your uh, master in chemistry assignment uh, that has the mole concept questions, uh, definitely get in touch with me uh, and we'll uh, make sure that we can do whatever we need to to um, elucidate the mole concept uh, so that you can move forward successfully. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, Avogadro's number uh, for a discrete atomic substance that's made up of just one atom in its simplest uh, condition, what we call monatomic uh, substances, the molar mass, the mass of a mole of that substance, is the mass you would find on the periodic table. Uh, so for carbon, for instance, we would uh, say it's 12.011 grams for uh, a mole. Um, Every substance has a molar mass, a mass of one mole of it, uh, and it's a result of the sum of the atomic masses of the elements in the compound. So uh, even things that uh, might have uh, you know, two atoms of the same type, for instance, uh, we look at uh, the molar mass of water, H2O, uh, is 18.0 grams or 18.0 uh, grams per mole, uh, right? If we're talking about one mole, uh, then uh, we'll typically use the uh, symbol, the uh, gram per mole for the molecular mass. That's two times the mass of hydrogen, which is roughly one gram per mole, and then one times the mass of oxygen, which is uh, roughly 16 grams per mole. And so two times one uh, is two, plus 16 is 18 grams per mole. So now that we understand the, the mole concept, that a mole is an amount of substance uh, that uh, corresponds to Avogadro's number of particles uh, for that substance, we can do some conversions. So if we happen to know how many atoms or molecules we have, uh, we could use Avogadro's number to determine uh, the number of moles or fraction of a mole that we might have. Uh, so if we just said that water has 18 grams per mole, um, well, if we have uh, a mole of water, we would have 18 grams of water, or we would have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd uh, water molecules. So we can make use of those uh, values so that if um, we had, for instance, 36 grams of water, uh, well, we would take that 36 grams uh, mass and uh, divide it by the molar mass, 18 grams for one mole, and see that we have now two moles of water. And if we want to use Avogadro's number, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, 
Uh, well, if we have uh, twice that, if we have two moles, then we must have twice that value, or 12.044 times 10 to the 23rd, uh, which in correct scientific notation would be uh, 1.2044 times 10 to the 24th atoms, or in this case, molecules, if we're talking about a, a molecular substance like water. So we've got a lot of good understanding now. We've uh, taken some observations by geniuses like uh, Lavoisier uh, and Berzelius, and uh, Dalton has combined those into a, a pretty um, robust atomic theory. Not perfect. A uh, few things are, and uh, science is always up for review, but uh, a good first start at atomic theory by Dalton. Um, but uh, we really didn't have a good handle on uh, the behavior of the elements. Uh, we knew some chemistry that some things did, and we were learning more about them, but it was really uh, Dmitry Mendeleev uh, in 1869 who uh, organized the periodic table for us. Take, took that chaos of a, a list of uh, different elements uh, and really put it into uh, a very... Um, useful arrangement, the periodic table, uh, that um, he did by uh, observation uh, and a pattern recognition. So uh, his table uh, was in order of increasing atomic mass, uh, which we did uh, modify it a little bit because it's uh, there are a couple times when um, the atomic mass doesn't quite go up uh, with atomic number uh, exactly. So we'll talk about that. Uh, when we talk a little more about the table. But um, Mendeleev, just like Dalton, a uh, good overall idea, minor flaws that got uh, adjusted later, but uh, a huge step forward. Uh, he was even uh, bright enough to see that he needed to leave gaps for undiscovered elements. Uh, we had discovered the elements out of order, uh, and he knew based on the properties that there were some elements missing, and he could predict a lot of the properties of those elements with really, really good um, predictive power. He was very close, uh, if not uh, right on, for most of the predictions he made. So um, that that's really great to see the accuracy that uh, he had based on uh, knowing uh, something about uh, the elements that existed. He was able to make great predictions about elements that had yet to be discovered. And we see here an image of an early periodic table Again, probably not uh, the Russian table of Mendeleev, seems to be German here, uh, but an early arrangement of elements uh, in this periodic type fashion where you have uh, horizontal uh, rows and vertical groups uh, that uh, are arranged by a similar chemical uh, affinity and behavior. Okay, so taking a look at the uh, image in the middle top of our page here, we have uh, a, an entry in a modern periodic table. Um, at the very top, we have the atomic number, uh, sometimes symbolized as Z for generic atomic number. In the case of the element uh, we're looking at here, which is iron, uh, the atomic number is 26. So you have 26 protons in the nucleus of every iron atom. If you had 27, uh, you wouldn't have iron anymore. 27 protons in the nucleus gives uh, the element cobalt. So uh, it's very important that you understand uh, the importance of atomic number, uh, and that uh, is to determine the identity of the element based on the number of protons in the nucleus. Uh, in the middle, we have the element symbol. Uh, in this case, the chemical symbol Fe makes relatively little sense with the English word iron, which has neither an F nor an E in it. Uh, but if you know your Latin, uh, ferrum is the uh, Latin uh, word for iron or sword, uh, and uh, that is where the chemical symbol comes from. So the Fe is from ferrum, not from iron. Uh, and that happens a few times, uh, so we should probably know the first 30 elements by name and symbol, uh, and some of the symbols will not make much sense at all. Uh, there's a couple other select elements that uh, we'll encounter a lot, and we'll get to know, like lead, which is PB for plumbum. Uh, which is again from the Latin. So uh, these elements that have been known for a long, long time, like iron and lead, will often have irregular symbols. Some of the more recently discovered elements, uh, like tungsten, the symbol W for Wolfram. Uh, so that depends on, uh, again, the German name for it. So when the name uh, comes from another language, the English name doesn't always make sense with the chemical symbol. 
Finally, down below, uh, we have the atomic mass. Uh, sometimes you'll see the atomic mass up top and the atomic number down at the bottom, depending on the table. Uh, but it's pretty easy to tell the difference. The atomic number is always a smaller number than the atomic mass, and it's also uh, a whole number, whereas the atomic mass, being a weighted average, uh, uh, usually is, is not a whole number. It, it gives rise to many decimal places. Uh, so for iron, for instance, uh, we have an overall weighted average mass of 55.847 grams per mole. Uh, that's due to the natural abundance of the four stable uh, isotopes of iron. So you have iron 54, iron 56, iron 57, and iron 58. So all of those being iron have 26 protons in the nucleus, uh, but they have different numbers of neutrons, these massive particles that uh, give mass but don't change the identity of the element. So uh, the most abundant, iron 56, has 26 uh, protons and then 30 neutrons. Iron 54, still having 26 protons, has uh, 28 neutrons. Iron 57 uh, would have still the 26 protons and now 31 neutrons, and iron 58 would have 32 neutrons to the 26 protons. Uh, so uh, the uh, mass there being closest to 56 tells us that that iron 56 is probably a pretty abundant isotope, and indeed it's over 90%, 91.754% uh, of iron atoms are iron 56 isotopes. 5.845% uh, are iron 54 uh, isotopes. That's pulling us down a little below the 56 grams per mole that we might expect. Iron 57 is about 2.119%, and iron 58 is less than 1%, 0.282%, a very small uh, natural abundance due to uh, iron 58. There are also 20 some uh, radioactive isotopes of iron. We don't include those. Uh, we only include the stable isotopes. If the element has no stable isotopes at all, if you look down at the bottom of your periodic table, you'll probably see some elements like californium and einsteinium uh, in brackets for their atomic mass and that just indicates that they have no stable isotopes uh, and that's the most long-lived of their radioactive isotopes atomic mass. We also see down below uh, some of the predictions that uh, Mendeleev made and then the observations uh, by Winkler for the element germanium. Uh, Mendeleev had called it echo silicon because he left a place below silicon in his table for this new element and as we see the mass very close 72 versus 72.6 grams per mole uh, density 5.5 versus 5.47 grams per cubic centimeter uh, color just a bit off dirty gray is what uh, Mendeleev had expected grayish white is what uh, was observed um, the oxide they uh, predicted uh, Echa silicon O2 and germanium O2 is indeed the formula, uh, but the uh, density of the oxide is just a little more, very, very little more than what uh, Mendeleev predicted. And finally, the, the chloride, the tetrachloride uh, for germanium oh, echa silicon, as uh, Mendeleev called it, he predicted less than 100 degrees Celsius, and it turned out to be 86 degrees Celsius. So very, very uh, powerful predictive uh, properties that Mendeleev was able to harness here. Uh, just goes to show how um, robust his uh, periodic table was and how much he was able to predict from it. So with uh, Dalton, atomic theory was uh, based on uh, indirect evidence from a lot of observations. Uh, Dalton never saw an atom, uh, and indeed, uh, most people in history never saw atoms because it was only relatively recent, uh, the last uh, few decades, where we've had anything close to the technology needed to visualize atoms. Uh, so uh, nowadays, we live in a, a very exciting time because we can visualize atoms. Uh, it requires you to believe in atomic theory and uh, believe in these things we call electrons that make uh, our electrical society uh, possible. Uh, but using those electrons, uh, we're able to image uh, atoms or groups of atoms and even manipulate individual atoms. Uh, so we have very exciting possibilities ahead now that we 
have not only uh, thoroughly understood the atom with atomic theory, but now can actually image and manipulate individual atoms. And so we see here a computer enhanced image of uh, some small groups of atoms. Uh, very, very exciting stuff. We already encountered the idea of green chemistry back in chapter one, uh, but as a reminder, green chemistry means replacing rare or hazardous substances with more abundant or less hazardous substances. And so in our text, we see the example of uh, replacing these uh, compact fluorescent light bulbs, which require mercury, uh, very, very small amounts, but still uh, mercury is a, a hazardous substance. Uh, and uh, it's been replaced uh, with light emitting diode, uh, uh, very efficient lighting technology that does not require uh, mercury in order to function. Another example, if you've been following lithium ion batteries for any length of time, um, the uh, cost has come down and the environmental concerns have uh, come down as well uh, because uh, in the early days, the uh, commercial lithium ion batteries all required cobalt oxides to work and cobalt's a pretty rare element and a pretty toxic element. Uh, so the price of cobalt was driving the price of lithium ion batteries. Uh, more recently, uh, iron phosphates have been used as cathode materials to replace the cobalt oxides. And these iron phosphates, of course, iron is a much more abundant element. Iron phosphates are much less environmentally harmful. Uh, so we've uh, done a lot of good green chemistry by replacing uh, a rare and hazardous substance like the cobalt oxides with a relatively less rare, less hazardous alternative like the iron uh, phosphates. So lots more to come with green chemistry and hopefully uh, we'll be making big advances in lots of, of ways uh, in the near future. So we'll uh, wrap up chapter two here. Hopefully you got a good overview of it and you're ready to get into your mastering chemistry set and try out some of these things uh, and uh, use hints when necessary, contact me as necessary, but uh, hopefully discover uh, a lot of this on your own. Good luck, chemists.